Father, we need your word. We need your word to invade our souls and bring clarity. To penetrate our hearts and bring comfort. To infiltrate our minds and bring wisdom. You've started a good work in us. We need you to continue that work today. There are deep voids in us that can only be filled with the truth of your glorious character. There are crooked thoughts in us that can only be straightened by your glorious correction. Father, we came to feast. Please, spread a table. This is our corporate plea. Amen. We are in week two of our 13-week study in Philippians. Last week, I told you this verse-by-verse exposition would last 12 weeks, but this week I added another week. You're welcome. And before we dive into these verses, we need to orient ourselves to the surroundings. Before we dig the holes, we need to survey the terrain. So let's talk about who's writing and who's reading. This letter was written by a guy named Saul, but not the Saul of the Old Testament. Not the one who stood head and shoulders above everyone else. That dude was a beast. Athletic, commanding in personal appearance, a charismatic leader. He just had the it factor. He had the brains, the brawn, and the beauty. He was tall, dark, and handsome, like your preaching pastor. (laughs) Our Saul is different. That Saul spent his days in palaces. Our Saul spent his days in prison. And there's a first century non-canonical book. And in it, there was a physical description of our Saul. The book tells the story of a man named Anisiphorus who was going to meet Saul and was told by Titus what Saul looked like. And here's what he said. He's a man of small stature, with a bald head and crooked legs, with eyebrows meeting and a nose somewhat hooked. Quite different than the tall, dark, and handsome Saul of the Old Testament. He was short, pale, and big-nosed, looking like a bow-legged Danny DeVito with a unibrow. Now that description probably has you thinking he's short, tubby, and jolly, but that wasn't exactly the case. He was more like a little Al Capone mobster. He used to be involved in mob violence against Christians. He hunted Christians like a lion hunts his prey. He was mean and full of hate. He had no feelings. The gospel writer Luke says on one occasion that Saul was breathing threats and murder against Jesus' followers. And, And the Greek word for breathing threats was used of a war horse viciously snorting and running to battle. Saul had a taste for the blood of Christians. Calvin calls him wild, a wild and ferocious beast. Luke paints him as more wild animal than human being. And on one of these human hunting trips, Saul was stalking his prey, but was completely unaware that he himself was being stalked as well. God chased him down and redeemed his wretched soul. Quite a few of you like to read after C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis's salvation account was similar to Saul's. Lewis used the last chapters of his autobiography to paint images of Christ's pursuit of him. And he likens God to an angler luring his fish, to a cat chasing a mouse, to a pack of hounds closing in on a fox, and to the divine chess player maneuvering to a checkmate. Saul, a first century mobster, a murderer, now a Christian, now writing books. Don't ever underestimate the reach of God's grace. As Francis Thompson once penned, Saul was hunted by the hound of heaven. God gave this man a new heart and he gave him a new name. Saul became Paul. Paul goes on to be the greatest church planner in the history of the world. He travels through modern-day Greece and Turkey, establishing churches. One minute attempting to purge the land of Christians, the next minute attempting to fill the land with Christians. First writing death warrants for Christians, now writing love letters to Christians. He's a missionary, a church-planting missionary. Every missionary you find in the Bible is a church planter. Paul was a gatherer. It's important for church planters 
to, to be gatherers. Uh, some guys who pastor churches of a thousand people make terrible church planters. They can sustain growth, but they can't start it from scratch. They're not gatherers. And so let's look at the group that, by God's grace, Paul gathered. Who, who is reading? Ten years before reading this letter, Paul's church planning team parachuted into Philippi and evangelistically gathered together a people to form the first church in Europe. Paul first met Lydia in her little Jen Wilkins Bible study group by a river. He led her to Christ and then baptized her entire household. Next was a slave girl of whom he cast a demon out. And her fortune-telling pimps didn't like it and had Paul locked up. The jailer saw these men praying and singing while suffering, and it wrecked him. He believed in Christ and was saved. Paul baptized his entire family. Notice the ethnic diversity. We have Asian, Native Greek, Roman. Notice generationally in this church, we have middle age, late teen, retired. Economically, you have white collar, no collar, blue collar. They all had different starting places. They've all grown in Christ at different paces. And they're all reading this letter 10 years after their salvation. And here's the first truth that Paul wanted them to grasp. And it's this. God completes what he begins. God completes what he begins. Verse 6 says, I am sure of this. Paul slams his hand down on the writing desk. I am absolutely convinced. My mind can never be changed. About what? He continues, that he who began a good work in you will finish it. The verb began, would you, would you mark that? It's, it's interesting. It's only used one other time in the New Testament. And in that other use, it's referring to salvation. So this good work is salvation. Who was it that began the good work in you? He. Who's the he? God. Paul is emphasizing the initiative of God in salvation. Salvation is God's work. He is the initiator of it. In the word began is forethought. This is not an impulsive work, but a planned work. Executed to perfection. And for those of you who struggle with the assurance of your salvation, what a wonderful verse. God is at work in your salvation from beginning to end. You are not strong enough to fall away while God is resolved to hold you. You are safe in his hands. And by the way, God knew your past before he began the good work of your salvation. He knew the worst about you and saved you. No one can produce fresh evidence to make God walk off the job or quit the work or convince him because of your failures that it's really not a good work. God never has a project that sits unfinished. So this verse speaks primarily about salvation, but secondarily it speaks about sanctification. God is the author and finisher of your salvation, but God is also the author and finisher of your discipleship. Your discipleship is ultimately held in the hands of God. When he saves you, he puts you on a program of growth. You are enabled more and more to die to sin and live to righteousness. God has given you the power to accomplish what he has called you to accomplish. Now, Satan doesn't want you to hear that. Well, I can't kick this addiction. I can't be disciplined in this area of my life. Stop that. That's anti-gospel. We have an entire church culture glorying in not being able to overcome certain sins. Whether the sin is pornography or anger or coveting, or anxiety. They are building websites and social media platforms and writing books off to the idea that they will always struggle and never be able to truly get victory over this sin in their life. And if you're in Christ, there isn't any sin that has such a tight hold on you that the gospel cannot break. Tomorrow doesn't have to be like yesterday. I tell my wife sometimes at these 
ladies online, these ladies online who struggle with anxiety will never overcome it in the gospel. Because if they did, they would lose their ministry, their social media platform, and their thousands of followers. Because it's all built on the struggle with anxiety. And that's destroyed if the gospel finally defeats that struggle. Now, now I, am not, I am not saying that I believe in sinless perfection. I don't think sinless perfection exists. In this life, God will carry you on towards completion and one day finally complete it when Jesus returns for you. In fact, that's what the Bible says at the end of verse 6. We'll bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Now, let me apply this one point and this one verse. I've got, I've got four truths today, and then I want to apply each of them. But here's the application. This is good news for the pastors of this church and for the people of this church. I'll apply it first for the pastors of this church. You know, you know what's exciting about this verse to me? Nobody is going to get lost. God will not lose one of his. I, I played basketball in high school. You guys have heard of Michael Jordan. My jump shot was very similar. Uh, however, it didn't have the, the same end result. Like, we lost the game because you missed the last second shot. That's never going to be said to me in heaven. The Lord is never going to look at me and say, Do you realize that because you made that choice, 450 people didn't get saved and go to heaven? He's not going to say, You went with that color carpet in the new auditorium? You chose that building design? You dropped Sunday school and replaced it with small groups? We don't even have, we've never had Sunday schools here. I'm just giving you examples. I, I told Sarah I might step up my clothing game in the next building once we complete it, which hopefully is by January. Um, I, may, I may wear a suit coat. I may. The people started laughing at me in the first service. It was full and one started laughing. They all, I was offended. God isn't going to be like, oh, you put on a tie? That limited my work in Oak Grove. Yeah, we, I could have added another 400 people if you stayed in a polo. No. I mean, and that would drive me crazy, knowing that something I did made it impossible for someone else to get to heaven. This verse is freeing for pastors. God says, I'm going to start the work, continue the good work, and complete the good work through Faith Family Church. And I'll use you, but it doesn't depend on you. So I just serve God with freedom and sheer joy in knowing that he builds this place, not the pastors. So this is an application for the pastors. Now, now let's apply this for the people. How many of you have ever had an incomplete grade in school or college? Like a class you never finished, you opened up the report card, you were expecting an A, but there was an I. How many of you have an incomplete project right now at your house? Would you confess your sin? And raise your hand. Wives like, raise your hand. <laughs> God never receives an incomplete. He never has an unfinished project. Kent Hughes, a wonderful pastor of College Church in Wheaton, Illinois, said, As I reflect on my 50 plus years in Christ, it is indeed God who has kept me. It is not my grip on God that has made the difference, but his grip on me. I am not confident in my goodness. I am not confident in my character. I am not confident in my history. I am not confident in my perseverance. But I am confident in God. Love that. God is not like men. Men conduct experiments. But God carries out plans. And dear church, you are God's plan. And he'll carry you through. And he'll receive an A on his good work. Second truth is this. God gifts, God gifts this gospel to you. That you might defend it and proclaim it. Notice verse 7. It is right for me to feel this way about you all. Now let's do a hard stop there. If Paul were from the south, he would say, it's right for me to feel this way about y'all. If he grew up in the Ohio River Valley, he'd say, it's right for me to feel this way about you uns. 
or northeast yous guys. The point is, it's a plural you. He's saying, I'm talking to you, Lydia. I'm talking to you, former possessed girl. I'm talking to you, jailer. I'm talking to all of you. Paul is, it seems like he's defending what he said about them. It is right for me to feel this way about you. Like he's anticipating a question, the question of how dare you say that. But Paul says, no, 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 no. It's, it's right for me to say that. You can never outpace grace. For you are partakers, the verse continues, with me of grace. So they were literally partners in grace. Their mutual union in Christ made their hearts beat as one. And friends, that is what is happening at Faith Family Church. Our hearts are beating as one. One goal as we move as a family to that goal. Partakers of grace, notice as the verse continues, both in my imprisonment. Now, here's where I'm going to let you in on a little interpretive secret. I haven't mentioned it so far in the series, but Paul is in prison. He's actually imprisoned in Rome, and he's writing to little Rome. Don't picture a cell block with iron bars and locked doors. The Greek word means chains. So he's under a type of house arrest in rented quarters. He has a freedom to receive guests and write letters, but guards are chained to him at all times, depriving him of certain freedoms of movement. I'm shackled to the guards by chains, but I'm shackled to you by the gospel. That's what church membership is. I'm shackled to you in the gospel. The Philippians were not ashamed or intimidated by Paul's imprisonment. Paul says, I'm risking my life, but you're risking your reputation when you stand with me. So in my imprisonment, notice as the verse continues, in the defense. The word defense is the word apologia. The Greek word is, is where we get our word apologetics. The defense of the gospel to those outside of the church. Paul adds, and confirmation of the gospel. The word confirmation is the word that refers to the building up of the body. So look, this, this is important. Would you look at me? These believers are partnering with Paul in defending the faith to those outside of the church and building up the faith of those inside of the church. Now let's apply verse 7 in this second truth. How might we defend and proclaim the gospel like Paul illustrated and apparently like the Philippians are doing? Let's go back to our handy-dandy chart. I added a, another category on the chart. Notice spiritually. The church was made up of former religious and irreligious people. How did Paul reach Lydia's? And some of you single guys are like, yeah, for real. How did he reach a moral girl that's also loaded? How do we feel FFC with Lydia's? I've got my pen. I've numbered one to ten. You know, go. Well, when I say how do we reach Lydia's, I mean by that, how do you reach very conservative people who have a religious bent but aren't actually followers of Christ? It's in this space that Jesus stepped in and saved some of you. So two ways to reach religious people. First, invite them to study the Bible with you. Lydia was actually spiritually interested. Paul engages her in a spiritual conversation, and then he studies the Bible with her. And there are lots of people in our community who fit this profile. For whatever reason, they are open to having spiritual conversations. And I always like the read a chapter, answer four questions format. So read a chapter in Amos and then answer four questions. Four questions. What does this text reveal about God? What does this text reveal about my fallenness? How does this text point to Christ? And what should I do as a result of this text? This day after day, reading a chapter, meeting, studying the Bible together. Secondly, invite them to church. My commitment to you is that I'll get the conversation started. You continue it over lunch. Hey, what do you think about what the pastor said? And he says you can think you're a Christian, but you're not actually a Christian. What do you think about that? See, that's how you reach Lydia's, religious but lost. But here's the problem. For most people and most churches, evangelism stops there. But there's another type of person who will not be reached by inviting them to church. That slave girl and jailer will never naturally show up to a Bible study at a riverside. Every year there's just more and more people who aren't going to church. A British theologian, Steve Timmis, 
cited a recent study in which 70% of Brits said that they have no intention of ever attending a church service for any reason. Not at Easter, not for marriages, not for funerals or Christmas Eve services. 70%. And, and here's what he says, and I quote, That means new styles of worship will not reach them. Fresh expressions of church will not reach them. Great first impression teams will not reach them. Churches meeting in cool venues will not reach them. Now, allow me to stop the quote here and insert this. This is why we're not a part of the seeker-friendly movement. Really big in the 80s, uh, championed, by, championed and perfected by Rick Warren. Still exists today, and, but it's, it's, it's beginning to fade out. This is also why we're, we're not in the Stephen Furtick movement, which is huge in AG churches. The largest churches in Clarksville are, are AG churches. All right, let me get back to the quote. The vast majority of unchurched and de-churched people would not turn to the church even if faced with difficult personal circumstances or in the event of a national tragedy, like a pandemic. He continues, It is not a question of improving the product of church meetings and evangelistic events. It means reaching people apart from meetings and events. End quote. Let me illustrate it a different way. Hit it from a different angle. There's a pastor in North Carolina, Raleigh, who... Um, before he pastored, he lived in a fundamentalist Muslim country as a missionary. And he said, when I lived in a Muslim country for a few years, at no point did I consider going to the mosque, regardless of how relevant or funny the imam was. I wouldn't have gone for a special holiday. I wouldn't have gone when I was on hard times. I wouldn't have gone if the imam were doing a really helpful series on relationships. Islam was a completely foreign world and one in which I clearly didn't belong. How are we going to proclaim the gospel to people who feel like Christianity is a completely foreign world? To the slave girls and to the jailers. Well, this is easy. Go to them. Find them in the jails, in the parks, at the sporting events and build relationships with them. Unpack the gospel to them on baseball bleachers and sitting in pedicure chairs and while lifting dumbbells inside of their work cubicle. You go to them. Third truth. At salvation, God gives you both new yearnings and new affections. Verse 8. For God is my witness. How I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. Now, if you're looking at, the, if you're looking at this whole chapter as, as one piece of literature, Paul digresses for a bit here. And this digression highlights his new yearnings and affections. And I don't think Paul was naturally an affectionate person. Now, you say, you just say that, Kyle, because you're not an affectionate person. M maybe. I don't think Paul was naturally an affectionate person. I could be wrong, but his personality doesn't appear affectionate. Peter maybe, but not Paul. Peter was a feeler. He wore emotions on his sleeve. Paul was a thinker, a man of action. But Paul used to say to Christians, I have you on my hit list. But now in verse 6, he says, I hold you in my heart. What a change. If you dissect Paul's heart, you will find these Philippians. There's, um, there's Lydia. There's the demon, former demon-possessed girl. There's the jailer and all of his family. He even uses the word feel in verse 7. And he didn't lose his man card. He, I didn't even know he knew how to spell the word feel, much less experience it, but he is feeling it. Though the apostle was in chains in Rome, his heart wasn't chained. And Paul is making an oath, something he rarely did. He calls on God as his witness, and he says, God is my witness how I yearn for you. I'm homesick for you. I wish I could be with you. The phrase, I yearn for you, is a word that means to strain forward. Uh, Dwight Pentecost, in his commentary on this text, brought up another original context for this word. And it was actually used for an athlete nearing the finish line. Uh, he's at the front of the race. The victory appears to be his, but he hears footsteps on the track immediately behind him. And a, another contestant is threatening to overtake him. 
So he strains with every muscle and nerve and fiber of his body as he reaches the finish line. He leans forward, straining to cross the line first. And that is Paul's passion here. I am straining with everything in my being on your behalf. I am putting everything I've got into you. It's what pastors are supposed to do for their congregations. I'm pouring out every fiber of my life for you. Yearning with the affection, notice this, yearning with the affection of Christ Jesus. Now it's, it's interesting to look at the word affection. The ESV translators chose it. The old King Jimmy uses the words, the bowels. I yearn for you with the bowels. It's the Greek word, splachnon. Basically, it refers to the area of soft internal organs in the body. Uh, today, we call the study of these internal organs, splanchnology. It's, uh, you see how it's very close to the Greek word. Now, it's an interesting term. It, it's the strongest word in the Greek language to express compassionate love. When they really wanted to express compassion, they would say, I love you with my bowels. Now, fellas, you can try that with your wife if you want. I'm recommending you go with the ESV here. Now, let me, let me segue into applying this truth. If you have the same old affections and the same old yearnings as before you were a Christian, you're not a Christian. Time will play that out. When I became a Christian, there was burst in me new affections and new yearnings. I didn't have to work them up. They were there. I lost affections and yearnings that I used to have. Paul lost the yearning to kill Christians and gained the yearning to be with Christians. Spend lots of time with them, not just one day a week. Paul lost affections for sin and gained affections for Jesus Christ. You have to evaluate your yearnings and affections. The fourth truth is this. God calls you to love and pray for your local church. God calls you to love and pray for your local church. Most missionaries send out prayer letters so that their supporters know how to pray for them. That's a wonderful plan. But Paul is sending a letter to the supporting church revealing his prayer list for them. How he is praying for them. This is a jailhouse prayer journal. And let's examine the prayer in detail beginning in verse 9. It is my prayer that your love may abound more and more. The word abound is in the present tense and it expresses the idea of continuing overflowing love. Not static love. I, I, I want your life to become like a Niagara Falls of rushing, cascading commitment. The old Latin commentator Bengal writes of this text, The fire in the apostle never says, it is enough. He consistently says, more love, more love, more love. But what type of love is Paul praying for? We know that Paul is not praying for a shapeless, uninformed, mindless love. He shapes love in the verse. And notice, love must be shaped by, what's the word there? Knowledge. The word used here for knowledge is used without exception in the New Testament for knowledge that comes from the study of God's word. A controlled love controlled by scripture. A high level of biblical and theological truth shaping love. You want to know what love is? Don't go to rom-coms or musicians who write love songs or authors who write romance novels. Go to theologians. Because you need to have a, a biblical and theological foundation that shapes what love is. And Paul was super passionate that his converts increase in this knowledge. In fact, he has four prison epistles, and he prays this exact prayer in all four of them. Here in Philippians, Ephesians 1.17, Colossians 1, 9 through 11, Philemon 6, same prayer. Why? False teachers prey on gullible, emotion-driven, loving people to finance their heresy. And love is not blind. Love is biblically informed. And it's tough to have both. A stout theology and abundant love. 
It's, it's really difficult for a church to have both. Uh, Jesus praised the church at Ephesus for its sound doctrine, but rebuked them for its loss of love. Speaking to the church at Thyatira, by contrast, Jesus commended its love, but critiqued its compromise with doctrine. We want to be like the church at Philippi, biblically informed and deeply affectionate. So our love is shaped by knowledge, but then notice as it continues, love is also shaped by discernment. And the word discern best refers to the ability to distinguish between things that really matter and things that really don't matter. Love laced with discernment. And love laced with discernment is very insightful. It's very perceptive. With time in God's word personally and under God's preach word corporately, you will develop a taste for the things that count, the things that last. You will learn to make choices that align your priorities with God's wise purposes for your life. See, knowledge asks the question, what is right? Discernment asks the question, what is best? Do you ever pray for discernment? Paul wanted the church at Philippi to be able to discern what really matters in life. Pray for discernment with how you spend your money. A thousand stresses you will never experience if you just simply discern how to properly spend your money. You need discernment with making decisions at work. You need this discerning love in your marriage, evaluating behaviors toward one another. Those of you who are dating never married or dating after divorce, you need discernment on know who to date. Child rearing, what to allow, what not to allow. Some of you have aging parents, tons of decisions there. But some of you make make bad job changes and bad decisions and bad friends and everything's just impulsive and you need this discernment this gospel driven discernment and now if i'm you and i'm out in the auditorium and i'm listening to me here here's here's how i would receive that i'm thinking to myself yeah these people around me do make stupid decisions they man they make so stupid Mm, they have no discernment and you my friend are a legalist Yeah, you hear everything and think it's for someone else. This is for you. You have blind spots with discernment. You say, I'm more discerning than the person next to me. You still have blind spots with discernment. And you need to pray desperately that God reveals it to you this week. Even if it's extremely embarrassing when he does. Don't go on in your blindness. Jesus died that you could see yourself and your sins and not be crushed by it. Because you see Jesus paying for that sin. Verse 10. So that you may approve what is excellent. Notice the word approve. A few images come to mind when I think of the word approve. Uh, Baseball tryouts. Wine tastings. uh, Food tastings. Even auditions. And each of these things are being evaluated. The judges are examining all to determine which is best. And this word, approve, even shows up in the writings of Herodotus in 500 B.C. Talking about testing oxen that are fit for sacrifice. Some were, they were all oxen, but some oxen was not fit, some some were fit. So there's so many different areas I could go here in, in application. But discern, evaluate, examine, let me just pick one. Evaluate your social media interactions. Why do you post the things you post? Are you baiting? Why the desire to post sensual selfies? That's just one area. There's so many areas. You will make 100 choices this week. Examine them and make sure you're choosing the best over the good. With your growing and maturing love, you need to choose the things that are, according to Paul, excellent. Excellent. Have you ever known a parent with a really smart child? And then that child goes off to college or grows up and eventually works in the marketplace. And you find that that parent is concerned because that really well-educated, really gifted, really intelligent young person is making the dumbest choices you've ever seen in your life. 
And that parent is deeply concerned because that parent doesn't want his or her child just to be smart. He wants that child to use discretion, good judgment, and be wise in discernment. And that's exactly what the Apostle Paul is praying for the Philippians and for you and for me. Not just that we would know stuff. In our type of church, we definitely would bend and lean that way. Not just that we would know stuff, but that we would have judgment and discretion and wisdom as we apply the truth of Scripture. In our home, we began reading Proverbs at night. Because I want our kids to develop a gospel-centered discernment. A gospel-centered grid in which to make decisions. Would you, would you ask yourself these questions? And I'm going to take my time with them because I, I want you to have time to process in your mind. Am I pursuing knowledge of Christ with passion? Am I pursuing knowledge of Christ with passion? Am I valuing knowing Christ above everything else? Am I in a church that faithfully teaches the Bible? Am I doing what is best with my life? Am I doing what is best with my time, with my money, with my mind, with my children, with my serving opportunities? Am I doing what is best in my relationships? Don't do good things. Do gospel things with your life. And why are those questions even important? Because we desire to be, verse 10, pure and blameless. In other words, testing and choosing the best things will always lead you toward purity and never toward impurity. And predictably here, Paul concludes with the doxology. All this is for the glory and praise of God. Now let me apply this last point. God calls you to love and pray for your local church. Read Paul's prayers And pray them for others. That sounds simple. You say, you know, I don't pray for the church because I don't know how to pray for them. The best thing you can do is pray the Bible for people. Read Paul's prayers and pray them for others. These are transferable petitions. Every Christian should be concerned about growing in love, knowledge, discernment, and about bringing glory to God. And one of the duties, I'm going to talk just to, to church members. Some of you are not church members. We're so glad you're here. If you're not a Christian, we want you to repent of your sin and trust Christ. If you are a Christian, you really need to join yourself to a local church, whether it's this one or another one. But I'm just going to speak now to our church members. One of the duties of every church member is to pray for the spiritual progress of fellow members. Take verses 9, 10, and 11 And pray them for individual members of our body this week. Let's stand together. Father, we have encountered your word. And it has revealed our sin. And it has pointed us to our Savior. Father, grant us wisdom that we may pursue what matters most in life. Knowing Christ, loving others, making your dear son known around the world. Grant us purity of motives. Keep us from envy. Keep us from complaining about people. Keep us from gossiping from competing for praise and recognition. Keep us from pursuing our own ambitions. We are owned by you. We are your slaves. Do with us and our families and our lives as you please. We desire to live our lives to the praise of your glory. In all our relationships, help us to do what is right and to do what is best.
This is our plea.